This morning's scripture reading will be Psalm 121. If you'd like to follow along, Psalm 121. I'll be reading from the NIV version. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Good morning. Uh, It's good to see everyone on the table to be out with us, especially if you're visiting with us. We're very thankful that you're here. You may have noticed uh, some interruptions that were going on in the back. Kelsey Booker uh, was having shortness of breath and some chest pains, and so the life squad came in and got her. So if you would, please bow with me in prayer as we begin. Your Father in heaven, we bow before you, just praising your high and holy name. We thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to be together to worship you. We ask your Father at this time that you'll be with Kelsey Booker, that you'll heal her, that you'll comfort her and the family. We ask you to be with the doctors and the nurses that are helping her. We thank you so much, dear Father, for the great comfort that you do give us. And we love you so much, and we ask that you continue to be with them. And it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Obviously, as we hear anything, we'll pass that on. You can open your Bibles to Isaiah, the seventh chapter. Isaiah, chapter seven, is what we're going to talk about. I appreciate Patrick reading that whole psalm. That way, I don't have to. But the whole psalm... It's talking about lifting our eyes up. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful song. It's interesting, the songs that Scott picked, which I appreciate, were around this same idea. It is well with my soul, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come. Is it well with my soul? We all just sing it loud and clear. It is well with my soul. Isaiah, the seventh chapter There are some interesting phrases that are used that I would like to point out to you this morning, beginning in verse 1 and 2. He says, Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, and the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that Razan, the son of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Ramallah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped at Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Now that is a description. I should have had you read these verses, Patrick. But you think about this. They are about to have people come and are threatening them. Right? There's no question about it. There's a threat that is obvious, and they know it's coming. In the house of David, it talks about the king hears about the enemy that is there. And his reaction, their reaction, is very similar to what ours, our reaction is during difficult times. The description, though, is just beautiful when it talks about that they shook like the trees. I think we understand that. There are times when we're scared. There are times when struggles and difficulties come along, and it can be talked about as us, as, and as hard in the hearts of the people shook as the trees of the forest shake, with the wind and I want you to understand something as we begin this morning that's okay it's okay so often in my life in my preaching time I come across people that don't think it's okay or it shows a lack of faith if you're scared or afraid it does not the next steps we're going to talk about will involve our faith But the initial reaction to an enemy or a horrible situation going on in our lives, it should bring fear. It should bring fear. Because it should remind us who's in control. And it should remind us where we need to go the next step when we're talking about our God. But it's a scary thing 
for God's people to be in a presence of the enemy, whatever the enemy is, for those particular moments. I always think of Psalm 56, if you turn over there with me. Psalm 56, David is talking about this. David, in this particular psalm, is at least viewed to be writing this one. He's in uh, with the Philistines. He's been seized. So he's running from Saul. So he has no friends in Israel and that, and that are in power. He's with the Philistines that are obviously the enemy. This is going to be after he killed their giant. And I want you to notice what he says. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, for man has trampled upon me. Fighting all day long, he, oppo- he oppresses me. My foes have trampled upon me all day long, for they are many who fight proudly against me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? All day long they distort my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. Because of wickedness, cast them forth in anger. Put down the peoples, O God. You have taken account my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottles. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call this. I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. In God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And they'll talk about the vows. But I want you to notice verse 3. He starts off by saying, when I am afraid. We know David was afraid. We know, we're told that he was depressed at times. That he was sad at times. You're going to go through those things. The key is the next part. I put my trust in God. I want you to notice what it says here, and obviously from a poetic standpoint, but this is what was going on with David. Saul had sent people out to ruin his character. It was character assassination. So not only was he trying to kill him physically, he was trying to destroy his name. And so you have people, as David tries to des- or describes here, that they want to fight proudly against me. They want to distort all my words in verse 5. All their thoughts are evil. They attack. They lurk. They watch my steps. They're waiting to take my life. All these horrible things that were going on. You think that's going to bring fear to David? Of course. When I am afraid, though, what's my next step? I put my trust in the Lord. In God, I'm going to praise. In God, I'm going to trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? We've talked about this before. We all have an answer to that. What can mere man do to me? A lot. They can do a lot. They can hurt us. They can persecute us. But what's David's point? What's Paul's point when he says it? They can't do anything to us when God is on our side. They cannot touch your soul. They cannot take you away from the Almighty's presence. God is going to protect us. He is going to be with us. But we need to understand that it's okay to be afraid. The question, as we've been talking about these last few weeks, is what's the next step? As we walk in a worthy manner, we're going to have persecution. We're going to have struggles. There's just going to be things in life that we go through, let alone as God's children, we're going to go through things. But what's the next step? Are we continuing to shake like leaves? Or do we find confidence and what God has to say. Going back to Isaiah, the seventh chapter, God sends uh, Isaiah to the people here. And picking up in verse four, he says, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Razin and Aram, the sons of Ramalia. Because Aram with Ephraim and the sons of Ramalia has planned evil against you, saying, let us, go down, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in the walls and set the sons of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor will it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Razin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, so it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Why would I have confidence in that? I see the enemy, but God says, don't worry about them. Don't worry about them in verse 7. It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. 
I see the enemy. How can you tell me it's not going to happen? I see them. I want you to think about how often we do this. We're told that God is going to be with us. You think Matthew, the sixth chapter, as an example, do not worry about tomorrow. We're told not to worry about tomorrow. Why? Because God's going to take care of us. What do we do? We worry about tomorrow. We're told the same thing. We see that there's some issue or an enemy or a struggle out on the horizon. God says, don't worry about them. I'll take care of them. It's not going to happen. He tells us, do not worry about tomorrow. Seek me first. I'll take care of you. And we worry about tomorrow. It's amazing how often we can read these stories in the scriptures and the people from then till now have never changed. We have not changed. We can react exactly the same. And our God is the same. Then he goes on, as we talked about in Isaiah, the seventh chapter, at the end, he talked about the point, you've got to believe it, though, which we're going to get into next. You have to be willing to believe it. The psalm that was read to us, let me turn over there quickly. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I want you to notice as you go through these psalms, a lot of times this psalm is called the guardian. And if you read the psalm, you can kind of understand that. It, if you um, underline words, it's interesting how many times he'll use the word keep, keeps, keeper, protect, talk about guarding. I lift my eyes up to you, God. I could stare at the enemy. I could stare at the issue. I could focus on that. I'm going to lift my eyes to you. Why? Because you're my keeper. You're my guardian. You're my protector. You're going to protect me and you're going to keep my soul. The danger sometimes is when this is just a psalm to us. When it's not real life. When we're not the ones that are looking up to God and understanding his power and understanding what he is, who he is. And sometimes we just think we know better. It's interesting to me, if you continue going back to Isaiah, we're going to skip over to chapter 10, though. There's a verse that I love because it hits me, home, it hits me and I'm sure it will hit you as well. Isaiah, the 10th chapter here, is talking about a different uh, punishment and various things that are going on. But the point that is being made in Isaiah 10, verse 15, is the same then as it is today. The arrogance or the pride of us thinking that we know better. I can see the enemy. I know they're going to attack. God says, no, they're not. I see them. I know they will. I want you to notice verse 15. Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it, or like a rod lifting him who is not wood. That's hilarious to me, because it's exactly what we do. Would an axe turn around and boast about what he has done to the one who's swinging the axe? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Is the saw going to exalt over the one that wields it? Yeah. That's the struggle sometimes. Us forgetting that if God says something, it is going to happen. And truly putting that into practice. When Israel, or Judah rather, is told that they're not going to affect you, they're not going to impact you. I want you to notice, if you go back to chapter 7 of Isaiah, what the next part of your Bible probably tells you what he's going to be talking about. The child Emmanuel. In the midst of all these things that are going on, this war that's going on against Jerusalem, you have this story or this prophecy that's given. That's, it's, don't worry about them. That's not going to happen. Let me tell you what is going to happen. There's one that is coming. Emmanuel is coming. And he's going to save his people. He's going to protect his people. But as verse 9 says at the end, if you will not believe, you surely shall not last. That's the same for us today. Do we really believe that God is going to do what God has said he's going to do. Those at West Mason know full well that probably my favorite uh, part of this story is when they're walking on water. Anytime water's involved, I like to talk about it. But Matthew the 14th, after Jesus is walking on the water, they think it's a ghost as we all would. Peter 
for some odd reason says if it's you command me to come out there and he does and you look at verse 29 it is amazing to me that he says he came out and he walked on the water peter walked on water we know jesus did peter walked on water verse 30 but seeing the wind he became frightened and began sinking to sink he cried out lord save me i want you to understand how easy it is for us to do this exact we focus on god and then we take our eyes off of him and we see the winds we see the enemy we see the struggles of life and we all have them and we begin to sink and become frightened. Thankfully, as in the case with Peter, God was there, Jesus was there to pick him up, to lift him up. When you shake like the trees, lean on God, he will lift you up. He will be with us. But only if you believe it. Only if you believe it. Only if we listen to what he has said. Do we focus on the waves or do we focus on the water? Or the one walking on the water, rather. Which one do we focus on? Do we focus on the one who is all-powerful or do we focus on those who simply have some power on this life, in this life, but do not control all of it and certainly do not control our eternal salvation? Over in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, <clears throat> Paul will talk about this this chapter, he'll talk about we do not lose heart. And, and really, this whole book, he'll talk about that. But the interesting thing when it comes to Paul is that he had every right to lose heart, I, most of us would say. For, he had every right to lose heart. But I want you to notice what was different about Paul. And it's the same thing that should be different about us. You can read the whole, both chapters, but in verse uh, 16 of chapter 4, he says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are tempor temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I'm going to stop there for now. The only way that the things that Paul went through can be viewed as a momentary light affliction is only if you compare it to eternity. Only if you compare it to eternity. Only if you compare it to the reward that was before him, as he talks about. The only way we can get through the things in this life is if we stop focusing on the things that are seen, the struggles, the difficulties, the enemies, and we focus on the things that are not seen, our God. We focus on that relationship that we can have. And we're able to get through all these things that we're talking about. Chapter 5 will go into the comparing the temporary and the eternal. And the fact that Paul was longing to be with God. Do we long to be with him? Verse 10, he tells us we must all appear before him. Therefore, in verse 11, that's why I tell everybody we need to persuade men. In verse 14, though, he says, For the love of, God, the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Does it control you? Does this relationship truly control you? I'm going to tell you. We have all been told that you are promised eternal life as God's children. We are promised eternal life as his child. We studied it in 1 John for a whole quarter. And yet there are still people that doubt. Even though you're walking on the path, you are doing the things that God has called you to do, that we struggle where we're going to spend eternity. God has promised you eternal life. But you've got to believe it. You have got to listen to Him. You have got to be willing to focus on Him and not the other things of this life. There are bad things that occur in this life and I always use the storms we have no control whether the storms come they're coming we're all going to go through them but where we focus during the storm that we can choose that is your choice there are people that are going through some horrible things 
in this congregation. Horrible things. Have our will. There's all sorts of things that are going on. And you can focus on them. Or you can focus on the God who promised to be with you through them. That's the choice that Judah had. That's the choice that we have. Are we going to go through this life as God's children, understanding how peace, how peaceful we can be, how much peace we can have in the midst of all this chaos? You can say what you want. I love the story of Peter walking on the water because Peter actually walked on the water. Where were the other disciples? In the boat. Where would I have been? Not in a boat. On the shore. But you think about it from our perspective. They, he got out of the boat. He walked on water. And even Peter needed the Creator. And so do you and I. If you do not have a relationship with Him, this is a difficult subject for you. Talking of confidence almost comes across as though I'm talking about our being arrogant for what we've done. We're, we're just the axe. He's the swinger. He's the one that swings the axe. We've got to understand his power, who he is, and what he is able to do for us. And he has promised you eternal life if you're his child. If you have not obeyed the gospel, now's the time. He's calling you home. We're going to sing the song about calling the prodigal home. He wants nothing more than to have a relationship with you. For those of us that are his children, that have obeyed the gospel, I strongly encourage you, as I do myself, make sure that you look at yourself. Make sure you're living as a child of the living God. That you understand that he is with you through all the things that you go through. It is okay to be afraid. But make sure that you're putting your trust in God. And make sure you always remember that He's going to be with you when you go through those things. And there is nobody that can do anything to your soul. You will be with Him for eternity if we live the life we have been called to live. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time. As always, make sure that you're praying for one another. But if there's anything that we can do for you right now, I ask you to please come.